Hearts Grave Band. That was awesome for Jesus. Thank you so much. Well, turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. As you're turning, I, I, just, I don't like to be braggadocious, but I did come from a, a wealthy family. We were international travelers, traveled around the States. You know, I'm just teasing. We had uh, 10 people in my family, eight kids, two parents. My dad always had like a Bonneville nine-pastor station wagon. But we did travel internationally. We were in Detroit. We would go under the, Detroit, the tunnel that went to Windsor, Ontario. It was before you had to have passports and visas. And we'd just say, hello, we're going on a Sunday drive into Canada. So it was another country. And uh, so that was, our, that was our, our thing that we would do. You know, pull into a bread store, get a loaf of bread, get a thing of peanut butter, get some bologna. Ah, lunch is served. And uh, my mom would make the sandwiches, pass back. The funny thing is we always had kids with us beyond our family. So one day someone took a picture. I think we had 18 souls in a, you know, like a 1959 Bonneville wagon uh, with kids sitting crisscross applesauce all over the place. And uh, we, we would travel to uh, faraway states like Ohio, a one-hour drive from Detroit. Uh, and, but here was an outing that we used to love to do that didn't involve any money. It was collecting fossils, digging for fossils. So we have our little pails, and our little rock hammer, and go to Big Boulder. And you know, you know those fossils, like the big fossils with the big bug eye, like uh, almost like, uh, I don't know what the, you know, like combination spider and cricket or whatever. And uh, you know, we get those fossils. And every once in a while, you know what happened? Uh, one of the kids, it was like a rite of passage, would find a, a vein of fool's gold. And it's called pyrite. And by the way, it's not a rock, it's a mineral, mineral. And it's the most abundant mineral on all the earth. But the kids would say, Mommy and Daddy, we struck gold. We're rich. You never have to work again, Daddy. Here it is. And, and then we'd all play along, and then we'd laugh, and then we'd, we'd... My mom and dad would have the teaching moment. All that glitters is not gold, right? It's called fool's gold. Now, dear ones, spiritually today, I want to drive something home. We're only going to use one verse of Scripture because uh, the title of the message is The Test That Never Ends. So I'll say this for Samson's sake. You know, Samson, there are going to be people, you know, I pray that you'll live a, a wonderful long life until Jesus comes or takes you home. But here's the thing. There will be people in your life that are going to tell you, I want to tell you something from the Lord and they will not necessarily every time be people who are really speaking for God. So every Christian, every, whether you're young or whether you're old, you need to know this test and you need to know how to administer this test. Because Jesus told us in Matthew 24, he was, he was asked about the end of the age and you know, when are all these things going to happen you know, of his second coming? And he said, listen, Take heed that no one deceives you, Matthew 24, 4 and 5. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will deceive many. And the Christ means the Messiah, the anointed one of God. Because Jesus is coming a second time, right? And he was saying, many are going to come and say, I'm he. He said, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, Matthew 24, 11. And again, in Matthew 24, 23 through 5, he said, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false apostles will rise. And here's the thing. They will show great signs and wonders. I mean, remember Pharaoh's magicians that were able to mimic um, you know, serpents and all these kinds of things? And he said they would deceive, if possible, the very elect. And he said, see, I have told you beforehand. And speaking of Christ's apostles, his apostles have said the same thing. Paul told the church at, at Corinth, I fear, 2 Corinthians 11, lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness that your mind should be corrupted for the simplicity that's in Christ. If anyone comes preaching another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel, he said, here's what I'm fearful for, about. You guys might actually put up with it. He said, but what I do, I will also continue to do and he said, there are false apostles, deceitful workers, and they transform themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder for Satan himself transforms himself into 
an angel of light. He's, he went on to say, it's no wonder if his ministers or his minions, other fallen demons, would do the same. So, dear ones, why was 1 John written? It was written 2,000 years ago because false apostles had invaded the church. There were people called Gnostics, and that is from the Greek word uh, that is from which we get our English word knowledge, and, and they were saying, we have special knowledge received from God. The common people like you don't have it. And their knowledge ultimately uh, involved a, a false doctrine that all created material was evil, and only the unseen world could be spiritual and could be good. And so they, they taught licentious living. They taught, you don't need to fight against the flesh. Just if it feels good, do it. Your body's evil anyhow. You know, just do whatever your little heart bids you to do and don't fight it. That's evil. And um, by the way, what does it do to the gospel? It destroys it. Because Jesus Christ is what? God in the flesh. He is Emmanuel, God with us, a fulfillment of Isaiah 7, 14. He is the child prophesied of in Isaiah 9, 6. He is the one who Moses said, the Lord will raise up a prophet like me from among your peoples. Him you will hear. He is the one who God spoke to uh, Adam and Eve saying, uh, and to the serpent saying, your seed, Mr. Serpent, is going to bite her seed's heel, uh, but, but her seed is going to crush your head. And so, dear ones, the Gnostics were lying about Jesus. There was a man named Serenthus who was saying, oh, Jesus wasn't really God. The Holy Spirit descended upon him at his, at his baptism, but it left him before he died. He died a man just like you and I. Which, by the way, are those that are Mormons do not believe. When they say Jesus, they're not talking about your Jesus, dear ones. If you ask them, was Je is Jesus Christ God's Son in the flesh? They will have to, in other words, God the Son, they would have to, in honesty, say, no, he is a Son of God, but he is not God the Son. He is not God in the flesh. And so we're going to learn all these things. There was other groups uh, the, that taught, uh, the Docetics taught that the, uh, Jesus didn't, wasn't real. He just appeared to be real. He was a phantom. And on and on it goes. So the title of the message is, This Testing Never Ends. The test that you have to know how to administer you're going to have to administer it to others for the rest of your life. And, and I'm going to get ahead of myself and say, this is not talking about combating spirit world like demons. And it's talking of when it says, when we're going to see test the spirits, he's talking about prophets that come into your life claiming to speak for Christ. You need to know how to encounter them and how to test them. So stand with me, if you will, to honor God. And we're going to read from 1 John chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 through 6 all in context. Remember last week we were you know, looking at the very way that you can know you're in Christ is by the spirit whom he has given you. And now he transitions to say, but there are other spirits in the world and we need to be mindful. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. And that's lowercase s, not, not God, but evil uh, false speakers, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. But this you, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now already is in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us, and he who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Lord God, in these fleeting moments, be our true teacher and preacher. Open our eyes to behold marvelous truths in my law. In Jesus' name and for his glory, amen. You may be seated, dear ones. We've got two simple propositional truths that flow from today's text. And the first is a command. It's a command of God. And the command is this, beloved, 
Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. So first of all, we're going to just say this point blank. Don't be gullible. Here's the command. Don't believe all that glitters is gold. Don't be gullible. On the contrary, what do we do? Test the spirits. Those who claim to speak for Christ, test them to see if they are of God. So we may as well, words matter. Every word of God matters. There's no words in here that are junk words. They all matter. And it begins, this text begins in the Greek with, uh, you know, you know agape. You've heard agape like a bazillion times. You know, uh, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is agape. God is love. And this is a, a, a compound word, and it includes the word uh, agape, and then it includes the word uh, friends. And so the word really is beloved. Some of you, I know the NIV says dear friends. But, you know, uh, next Sunday night we're supposed to do a wedding practice, and then uh, Sunday, um, Monday evening, a wedding ceremony. If I can't do it, Mark will do it. If Mark can't do it, Lanny will do it. Some will do it. But here's, here's the thing. The ceremony, I do the classical wedding vows. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today in the sight of God and in the presence of these witnesses to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony. Yeah, I don't truly use a false voice, but you know, but when you say dearly beloved, something special happens. People stop doodling. You know, ladies get all uh, crybaby like I did a, a moment ago uh, and uh, break out the tissues. Something good is about to happen. A miracle. Two are going to become one in Christ. That's how this text begins. Dearly beloved, who is he talking to? Ones who he loves dearly, the church. And so I can say, beloved. And here's how it reads in the Greek. Not, beloved, and then it goes right to a negative. Not every spirit do believe. That's how it reads in the Greek. It's so cool. It's kind of like Yoda speak, you know, happy to be, I am. Uh, it, it says, beloved, not every spirit do believe. That's the commandment of God to you. Don't be ready to sign up for everything that someone tells you in Jesus' name until you have applied the test to their life to see if they are from the Lord Jesus. I'm getting ahead of myself, but how many times have you like been walking around Walmart or something like that, and out of the blue, someone says, I have a prophetic word for the Lord from you today. And uh, that's happened to me. I know it's happened to you. And I say, great, what chapter and what verse? I want to read it with you. Oh, no, this is just a word. Oh, well, thanks anyhow. Uh, you got one? That's from the... and, and by the way, when they say that, almost always it's it's... It, you know, God loves you. I already know that. I'll show you the verse. Or that God wants to bless you. I know that one too. Romans 8, 28. Let's look at the verse. But dear ones, here's the thing. The apostle Paul was run out of a town called Thessalonica. You know, modern day uh, Turkey area. Um, and uh, what was he run out of town for? Him and Silas preaching the gospel. What happened? They went to a little town called Berea. And here's what the Bible says in Acts 17, 11. They were, these, the people in Berea, were more fair-minded. The King James says they were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? Be in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. I will never, ever have a problem uh, with any of you coming to me after a message and saying, Pastor Mike, I think you said, a little boy came up to me once and said, I was preaching about Daniel and the lions then, and the little boy said, you said uh, Artaxerxes when it should have been Darius, and, uh, and he was all bunched out up about that for like the whole message long. And, but I said, thank you for setting me straight. You're right, you're right. Uh, you know, there's a little thing in medicine. If your doctor gets all bunched up because you want a second opinion, you know the joke is find the new doctor. The doctor should not be all... Uh, proud about that you know doctors can make mistakes fine uh listen you're never going to hurt a preacher's feelings if you go home and dig through the word to find out uh if what we say is right in fact preachers have been taught you better be on your toes with the youth group because if you say the greek says they're going to google you and they're going to say man i don't know what he's talking about but that ain't what that greek word is he is going from his memory which is 
So you better be on your toes when you're with youth, right? But I love it. You need to test those who proclaim to speak for God to see if they're actually speaking for God. And you not only will not hurt our feelings, we'll be so happy to say, oh, there are dear saints of God that are checking for themselves. In fact, you know, one of my greatest goals is to help you to fall in love with Jesus and fall in love with his word so that you can't be sustained by just uh, Mike preparing a message for you for 30 or 40 minutes on Sunday morning. You got to get into it yourself. In fact, our goal is that you get into it every day. In fact, our goal is that you read the, the bulletin outline every day and that at the end of the year, you will have read the whole Bible through by just giving God 10 or 15 minutes. And then when you do that for one year and two years and five years and 10 years, you know, you'll be like Samson. You'll be like a walking Bible dictionary. And I love it when even kids can say, hey, you got that one wrong. Uh, I love it. So, so let's do that. And why is this important? Because not all these spirits are sent from God. Not all these people who, who claim to speak for God. And this is not new. This is in the Old Testament too. Jeremiah 14, 14. The Lord said to me, Jeremiah speaking, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I have not sent them, commanded them, nor spoken to them. Yet they prophesy to you a false vision, divination, a worthless thing, and the deceit of their heart. Again, Jeremiah 23, 21. I have not sent these prophets, but they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. I remember as a young man when I was licensed to preach the gospel at about age um, 22, I think. And I was trying to explain to the pastor about some of the ministers that I've been hearing and, and uh, their lives and their message didn't seem to match the Bible. And he said, yeah, that's called a lot of men went into the ministry, uh, but God didn't send them. <laughs> some went, but they weren't sent. And so try the spirits that's the message that has the word tried is is a funny greek word dokimazo and it you know what you know what the word is used for guess what um for a metallurgist who is you know something like my dad used to dabble in jewelry on the side he was a tool and die maker but uh uh he was and the more i think about my dad the more talented i realized he was but uh, so metallurgists they have jewelers they have uh they have ways of knowing if a diamond's a diamond, if gold's gold. Because gold can be covered with a little fake covering, but it's not gold underneath. Or, or diamond, you know, oh, how many people have been taken by buying their sweetie doll, a beautiful $7,000 ring, only to find out it was, yeah, it was glass. It was that, uh, that fake diamond stuff. So that's the word here, actually. Assay it, test it. See if what is being presented is real and here's what jesus said heaven and earth will pass away but my words will never pass away matthew 24 35 so again so many people read this text and they think oh we're called into spiritual warfare and it's like twilight zone no it's not that listen to what john MacArthur said about this uh he made this statement contrary to the view of some this command has nothing to do with personally confronting demons or performing exorcisms instead christians are to continually evaluate what they see hear and read to determine if it originated from the spirit of god or alternatively from demons the only reliable way to test any teaching is to measure it against what God has revealed in his infallible written word. To which I can only say amen and amen, which is why we plead with you to read your Bible for yourself and to read it daily. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of god and when we cry give us this day our daily bread it's not just wonder bread that we're talking about it is the word of god 
which is forever settled in heaven, Psalm 119.89, and which is the very thing that sustains us daily in our life. And one of those words is, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus is the miracle birth. I know we, we have some babies in our church and we call it a miracle birth. We've had people that have uh, thought that they weren't going to have any more children, and then they have a child and they say, oh, it's a miracle birth. But no, this is, Jesus is an actual miracle birth. By the way, never say never with God because uh, we, we, we did think we were all done with having children biologically, and we were. But God surprised us and said, you're going to have one, only this one you're going to adopt. And it wasn't on our list of things to do. So never say never with God. But dear ones, here's the thing. The gospel is rooted in the fact that Jesus Christ, knowing that this created world was off kilter, like a pinball machine on eternal tilt, Jesus had to do something about it, and he did do something about it. Before the world was even shaped, he was the Lamb of God who was going to come into this world, pierce the darkness, live a perfect life, die an atoning death, rise again from the dead, and then come back one day to receive us unto himself. And if you say that Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh, you've just gutted the gospel. There is no gospel. And that's why every cult will mess with Jesus. They will do something to undermine the simplicity of the gospel that Jesus Christ is both God, it's, it's profound, but it's simple. He is both God and man at one in the same time. That's why all the Gospels are, are so important. In Matthew's Gospel, he's the king of the Jews. In, in Mark's Gospel, he's the suffering servant. In Luke's Gospel, he is the son of man. In God, John's Gospel, he is the son of God. And he is all of those things. And you need to know the word of God. And, and there's a condition or, or a reason why we must not believe every spirit but test them. And again, we're going to drill down even harder because, look back at the second part of Verse 1, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. I've looked up the Greek word uh, for uh, many here, and it's the Greek word poly, and you know what it means in its richest form? It just means many. <laughs> you were looking for something fantastic. Many means many. And when the word of God says many, many false prophets have gone out, you can trust it means many. One of my Mikeyisms that I've taught you over the years, uh, and it's really based on the Word of God, is based on what we're looking at today. Not all television evangelists are bad, just most of them. Now, we have a, a beautiful family, uh, a, a, a granddad, a dad, um, a, a, a daughter, a granddaughter, and, and, and then great grands, I reckon, uh, who just moved here from San Diego, and they're with Dr. David Jeremiah, and he's on TV. So don't walk out of here and say, Mike said, everyone who's on TV is wicked. No, I didn't say that. I just said most of them. Uh, because the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel has permeated the airwaves. And it is not of God. And the Bible says many of them have gone out. So what I'm going to do in, in, in the 10 minutes that we have is just share something with you. And by the way, I'm making 20. I've got a lot of uh, like quotes I'm going to share with you. And uh, it's in the read the newsletter article because it goes over what I'm about to share with you right now. But there was a general, a, 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 a giant of, of Christian expositors, and his name was Carl F.H. Henry. And he wrote something in a book uh, back in the 80s. The title of the book was The Twilight of a Great Civilization. Hmm, wonder what country he was talking about. Here's what he said. What underlies the atheistic commitment to novel sexual and marital political platforms is a stultification, you know, just a, a, a dumbing down of biblical conscience in a religious redefinition of what is good and a profane will set. So let me just take you back that about 40 years ago when he was writing this, TV shows like Soap were being introduced. And yes, there was a homosexual you know, star in that series and the Christian church rose up and was angry and people said, oh, live and let live. It's, no, it's, just, a, it's just a sitcom now. But what's happened over the, over the you know, more than 30 years since he wrote this? You're now being inundated with commercials where two men are necking, and you're seeing it again and again and again, and to the point where you just don't even 
think twice about it. Girls with girls, boys with boys, whatever. Listen, he goes on to say this. The Christian world life view and secular world life view engage as never before in rival conflict. The conscience, the will, the spirit, the very selfhood of contemporary men. Not since the apostolic age, in other words, 2,000 years ago when John wrote this, not since that age has the Christian vanguard, meaning the church and pastors who preach the true word, faced so formidable a foe and a claim for the created rationality and morality of mankind. R.C. Sproul said it this way, we all have a philosophy of life, though we may not all be philosophers. We all have a worldview, though we realize it or not. And so, dear ones, one of my professors at seminary, he wrote a book in 2003. That was only 18 years ago. Dr. Alan Mosley. I learned Hebrew from him. Uh, so I spent uh, two years under his uh, teaching at Southeastern. I learned um, Old Testament from him. And when I did, went back three years later for my doctoral work, my first doctoral seminar was with Dr. Alan Mosley. He wrote a book called Thinking Against the Grain. And in the footnote of that book, he, he was teaching about a biblical worldview, the necessity for having our minds so soaked in the Word of God that the lens through which we see life is the Bible lens. So when garbage is peddled, we know right away, that, that's junk food, that's not even real food, that won't, that, won't even, that won't even keep you alive, that won't sustain you. In fact, it'll do you a lot of harm. So he said this, and he used a Barna survey, this was only, this was only 18 years ago, he said this, 52% of all self-proclaimed born-again Christians rejected the existence of the Holy Spirit. Remember, last week we talked about the Holy Spirit. So 18 years ago, half of people who said, I'm saved, did not believe in the person of God, the Holy Spirit, whom Jesus said, I will send to you. And he is the comforter. And he will be with you. And he will guide you in all truth. He will bring all things to your remembrance. 52% don't even believe he's real. He said, only 32% believe that Jesus physically rose from the dead. Flip that around. 68%. Only 32% did believe. That means 68% didn't. Oh, my goodness. 45% denied the existence of Satan. And only 26%, mm, I'm just reading this just to make sure I'm not, only 26% of Christians believed in absolute morals, absolute morals. In other words, absolute truth. And dear ones, here's what I've shared with you. Truth uh, Jesus is truth. Uh, there is absolute truth. His name is Jesus Christ. I am the way. I am the truth. And for only 26% of Christians to say there are moral absolutes, in other words, uh, there was a song on the radio, I've, I've done this before, but you know, we, we've, been, we've been indoctrinated for, for quite a few years now. Remember that song? Um, and uh, I remember, it, it's a pleasant song. It, it sang, it, it, it rhymed, it was, there is no good God. There is no bad guy. There's just you and me, and we just, what? Disagree. What is that saying? There's no absolute truth. Believe whatever you want. If that's truth for you, far out. If this is truth for me, far out. No, there is truth. And by the way, those who say, I don't believe in absolute truth, all you got to do is come back and say, do you believe it absolutely? Because if you do, it sounds like you do believe in absolute truth. Uh, <laughs> To me, just saying, the dear ones, we need to know that truth exists and Jesus is the truth. And Jesus said, Father, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. And so Mosley went on to describe what does it mean to have a biblical worldview? And don't, you don't need to write all these down because they're in your newsletter. I'm also making 20 copies of this for note takers who want the notes. He said, uh, to, to have a biblical worldview is this, to think in a manner that is consistent with propositional truth of the Bible. You know what I was, uh, you know, I have a lot of books I'm preaching, a lot of books how to do it right, and a lot of books that are wrong, but we had to learn those too. And you know, one of the things in our day, don't, don't preach propositionally. Don't stand up and boldly say, thus saith the Lord. It's a turnoff. People don't like it. Take them on a journey. It, uh, take them on a story of self-discovery. If they get the point, far out. If they don't, that's okay too. Don't wreck it by telling them, like, are you kidding me? 
man, I'm going to stand up and open the book. You don't need my uncertainties and doubts. You need to know what thus saith the Lord. So he said, it's, it's, it, it's to think in a manner that's consistent with there is actual propositional truth. This is truth. Anything that compromises this, this is a lie. Learn why the truth of the Bible is reliable and rational. The story is told of a man who inherited his mama's Bible. Those are the fun things to inherit where your loved one actually wrote something. So she had written in the outline, in the margins of her Bible, P and P, and then a little date, P and P, and then a little date. In the Psalms, T and P, and then a little date. He said, boy, I sure wish I knew what mom's T and P meant. But at the end of the book, he found where she had written, tried and proven. And so her Bible was like a prayer journal. I've tried the Lord in this. And by the way, the Word of God invites you to try Him. The Lord says, try me in this. Open, uh, bring your fruit in the storehouse. See if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there won't even be room to receive it. I'll stop the hand of the devourer in your life. God invites us to try Him in His Word. The third way, understanding the ways in which a biblical worldview differs from other worldviews. Dear ones, the world has a view that the sin of our day is what? What's the, what is the sin of our day? Intolerance. And, and so what does Christianity say? Uh, oh, uh, Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. So when the preacher stands up and says, Jesus is the way, the truth, and life, and there's no other way, the world says, foul ball! That's hideous! How dare you? You just dissed a billion Muslims. And the truth is, a Muslim, if he or she is honest, would have to say to you, I believe that your Christ existed. I believe that he was a moral man. I believe his teachings could even be admired. But there is no God but Allah, and Jesus Christ is not God's Son, God the Son in the flesh. Am I not dissing anyone when I say that? No, I'm saying we love them. We want them to come to know Jesus Christ, whom to know is life eternal. And so this is so important. And not only that, we need to live out the Bible truths. Don't just be hearers of the word, but doers. James 1. And don't just say you love me, but what? Keep my commands. And finally, he said, we need to develop the ability to communicate this to others coherently, comprehensively. In other words, you, if you just listen to what I've shared this morning, not, beloved, let's get it right, beloved, not, every spirit do believe, but, on the contrary, conjunction of contrast, test the spirits to see whether they are of God. You need to be able to administer this test. And we're going to see the test is not hard. Do you confess? And remember, in the Bible, a belief is not an intellectual assent. It's an absolute trust and submission to uh, the Lord of the Word and the Word of the Lord. Why do some people not preach the Word of the Lord? Because they do not believe in the Lord of the Word. So you need to be able to ask people this simple test. Do you believe, embrace, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, God in the flesh? And they say no, but he was certainly to be, you know, Gandhi said uh, he was certainly to be admired. Um, no, he is to be feared. For he is the one at whom every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Oh, dear ones, um, there's so much more I could share, so much more I need to share. Um, Aiken said, calling out and identifying false teachers is neither fun nor popular. It is, however, both biblical and necessary. They are often more dangerous and more plentiful than Christians realize. And John makes that clear in his uh, letter to us. You know, it's an old story, but it's a true story. Several years ago, a uh, Family came to us, big, uh, beautiful family, and they were lined up with their children. And I'm always desirous to go over and meet new folks and say, Hi, how are you? And, and the gentleman said, You know, um, after the service, he said, you, we're, we're not from this denomination, but thank you for preaching the word of God. 
he said, you know, we're Episcopalian, and we're probably going to stay Episcopalian, but right now our, our little um, church, the Episcopalian church, is going through a little bit of a split right now, a little bit of a, a problem, and here's why we're here. And if you, if you allow us, we'll stay here while I'm, while I'm stationed here. I said, it's allowed. Uh, he said, because we just got a new preacher. And she stood up, and she was holding the hands of her wife, and she said, you know, my name is Mary Beth, and here's my wife, Anne. And, the, you know, we live, we're Southern Baptists, so our, you, you choose your own preacher. No, no, one, no synod, no, no bishop, no uh, diocese or whatever says, oh, here's your new preacher. No, you all, uh, when, when I croak or when Mark croaks, Atlanta croaks, you all will decide, no, we want a man that's going to open the word of God and say, thus saith the Lord, and preach expositorily through a passage of Scripture. But he said, my new pastor said, uh, yeah, uh, that's what she said the very first Sunday. And I got my kids and we, we left quietly. We didn't, we didn't make any disrespect. We just, we just quietly left. I cannot have my kids sitting under someone who's openly lesbian and proclaiming the word of God. And the church not only knows it, they affirm it. Now, you did not hear me say be unloving towards someone who needs Jesus. No, you need to be extra loving but you need to not compromise the word of God. You need to have a biblical worldview. And I was proud of that dad and mom for saying, you know, even though we're, you know, listen, my grandparents were Episcopalian. And by the way, I was a little bit worried when my grandma died, you know, did grandma really know Jesus? And I went to her funeral. And the father, you know, they were like basically like Catholic priests, but they could get married. But that, their particular, man, he preached the gospel at her sermon, at her funeral. I was like, thank you, Jesus. And, uh, uh, I'm not throwing no denomination or anyone under the bus. I'm just saying, man, when something like that happens, you've got to stand up and say, not on my watch, not for my family. And so, dear ones, you need to know the Bible for yourself. It's not call your pastor to... No, you can know for yourself. Don't believe every spirit. Test the spirits. And if they deny what's in this book, then they are not speaking for the Lord. They're running. They may say they're running for him. They may wear a cross in their collar. Uh, but all the glitters, dear ones, is not gold. And so if you're here today and you've never repented of your sin and believed in the Lord Jesus, he's the only way to the Father, period. But he is waving you in today. Come, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. You can take your yoke upon it and learn of him, for he's meek and lowly in heart, and he'll give you rest unto your souls. And if you know him, dear ones, you need to dig in to just double down on your commitment to know this book so that you can test those who claim to know him, but clearly whose life and lifestyle deny that they know him. Father, have your way in this invitation moment. Add to your church as it pleases you. Save souls as it pleases thee. In Jesus' name and for his glory, amen. Let's stand, let's sing, let's respond if God has led you to do so. <laughs>